The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So this is the last use case uh, uh, day, and then Tuesday we'll wrap up. And I know that you all are preparing for finals and, and, and writing final projects, so it thins out at the end. So I thank you all for uh, showing up, those, those of you that are still here. Um, I also want to compliment there. Uh, I didn't get through all of the papers seriously, uh, uh, but I did uh, my best to read them quickly last night and today that were submitted for today. And just like the ones on trade finance, they're really good. They're, I mean, um, and, and if there's anything that was kind of the learning objective of this, this uh, don't get too happy, James. I mean, uh, I'll submit some on just now. So. What's that? Yeah, I, I read it. It was like two hours ago you put it in. I've got a slightly improved version. Oh, I don't think Canvas lets that. That would be a double spend, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Send it in. Send it in. Um, uh, is to show critical reasoning skills. What is this new technology? Why does blockchain technology make sense? And just like in trade finance and identity management, there's, there's a, 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 a data that really matters. And we'll talk about this a bit, but uh, the data really does matter, our identity and so forth. Um, but I wanted to turn back to uh, trade finance just for a minute, because James had challenged the whole group about supply chain management. And Lauren was a little quiet, but I, I, she knows I'm going to call on her, so this isn't a cold call. But uh, Lauren, you want to give your view on this a little bit? Lauren, who worked in supply chain management for four or five years? Yeah, so I, I mean, the big thing, like I worked in supply chain sustainability and there's been a huge push. I mean, it kind of the De Beers thing touched on this. There's been a huge push over the past like five to 10 years to just increase like traceability and transparency through supply chains to make sure like conflict minerals or to make sure that things aren't, you know, using a lot of water in water stressed areas and things. So there's been like a huge push for transparency through the supply chain and trying to figure out like how companies can basically like audit and assess their suppliers and like take it layers back. And so one big thing now is like it's all done through, I mean most companies do it through like assessment. So it's annually like companies assess their suppliers and hope that they submit all this accurate information and hope that their suppliers are doing the same things like throughout the supply chain. Um, but there's like very little transparency into it. There's, it's like very hard to verify. Um, and there's like really like asymmetrical information on all sides. So blockchain would be, I think for sustainability purposes, because right now you're just like hoping that companies are allocating the proper time and resources to like go through and track their um, like raw materials and suppliers and things. Um, but there's no real like verifiable or transparent way for it to be done. Um, and so like right now a lot of people are basically, like a lot of customers are hoping that their suppliers, you know, they're taking them at face value when they say things like we don't use child labor or we don't, you know, um, source from these certain material or um, regions, but there's like really no way to verify it. So a big thing, like I think a big opportunity for blockchain and supply chain is helping increase that traceability so that you know you're not coming from places where child labor is okay, you know, ideally you're coming from places with like good safety standards and things like that. Are we, have we gotten at least, I mean, are you still on the rock bottom minimalist side of supply chain blockchain management? Blockchain technology. Marginally better. Marginally better. But that's what's, what's wonderful about this class and even the eight or 10 uh, papers I read about identity management, identity and access management systems and blockchain technology ranged. I don't think I read any that were at a zero. There were no absolute minimalists, but there were some of your papers that veered towards that. And um, uh, Aline, who's going to talk to us probably sometime during today, I'd say your paper veered towards the most maximalist side I had seen you yet. In, 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 in 23 classes. With respect to a certain definition of digital identity, right. which is probably different than what most people think about. 
All right. So we're going we're gonna to hear from Aline maybe in 20 minutes or something. But mind you, that's the surprise of the class is he's, he's moved to the maximalist side, at least on one application for blockchain technology, uh, which is also, uh, I think, the right place to be is, is that this is a technology that might have use cases that work and others that are just hype. Um, there might even be some digital native tokens that will survive. And, and most, in, in my thought, won't. But there might be some uh, that make sense. Um, probably more applications, blockchain technology applications than um, tokens. Um, but uh, we'll start going through identity. So uh, again, we'll talk a little bit about identity before we get into a, a identity and access management systems. But what is identity? Um, then the sort of management of them, particularly in a digital age. Some state projects in um, India and Estonia. Uh, and then some blockchain technology projects, private sector, in essence. Uh, and then, of course, some of you might be graduating. We'll talk about MITs. <laughs> it is MIT. had to do that. Um, so, uh, and the study questions were, what are the trade-offs? Uh, what does it mean to be self-sovereign identity? And how might blockchain technology address that? And uh, we'll, uh, we'll see, uh, show of hands later, how many of you plan to get your MIT diploma uh, on a blockchain I hope, by the way, that all of you plan to get an MIT diploma, but there are some of you that are from Harvard here and from other schools. So maybe you'll come back to, to MIT. Um, uh, and then there was a handful of readings, which um, at least from the write-up seemed like they uh, reasonably did a job. So what is identity? This is an open question. Um, Tom, what's identity? I was going to defer to someone who wrote the paper today. You're going to defer to yeah, someone. Yeah. Oh, I see. Nice. I see. Who wants to say what identity is? James, you wrote a paper for today. Your birth certificate identifies you as an individual. In the, in the All right. So is is a birth certificate identity? No. Yes. Who who's <laughs> saying no? Uh, <coughs> Certificate is an identity because you can also be identified, for example, biometrically or with your fingerprints. So it is not only your birth certificate. It's, it, it is an identity. Like if you go to the DMV and you're going to get a license, you need a birth certificate to show at least. All right. What but is the birth certificate an identity? It is not what so identifies you. It's an identifier of your. Of identifier. You in the government's eyes. It's a certificate, right? Hugo? Yeah, I mean, I feel like this is a super philosophical question. Okay. Okay. But Are you feeling comfortable with that? No. I mean, no. All right, good. Um, I don't know, like identity is basically like who you are and all of the things that prove your identity currently are government issued documents or like school issued documents that prove that somebody else has already done the background check to make sure that you are who you say you are. Uh, first, first. I think identity is kind of contextual, so sometimes it can be your date of birth, sometimes it can be your nationality, sometimes it can be your face. It depends on the context, what identity is. Isn't it identity is uh, going back to the, to the philosophical domain. Identity is what defines you as a unique individual and differentiates you from anybody else, right? Uh, you I can think... use additional instruments uh, to to serve the purpose of um, identify you as, uh, as an individual to a certain context, as Broadish mentioned, that the identity is inherent to a person, not a, an additional artifact, to my understanding. So how many people agree with Eric? It's something unique that identifies. I agree. I agree. You agree. I think it's, it has to be something that you can verify in order to be identity, otherwise it's just a piece of paper. <clears throat> Wait, you think you have to be able to verify it? But, but yeah. Eric was saying that it's unique. It's something about our humanity. It's about who we are. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, identity, I, I mean, as Hugo said, I think it's very philosophical. I think it's who I am. So like my identity is like with my name, you know, this with date of birth and like with my eye, like 
like iris and like my finger like this is who i am and i think what you were talking about is more like how can the society verify like that you are the one who you claim to be um so i think there's different kind of layers that we're talking about oh, just, i think it's like not unique in the sense that it's like, not unique in yeah. the sense that like it's like characteristics that someone has but like maybe someone else will have the same characteristics but it's more yeah as uh, G just said like basically like someone can verify that what you say is true like you have these characteristics and that's part of your identity but there's it's not like unique in the sense that it's just like so Alexis are you saying your identity is not unique or are you saying certain attributes it's unique for me but like it's just like aggregation of characteristics Aggregation of characteristics. We are going to get philosophical. This is so good. If you want to get philosophical, you have to. Do, we can say that the, uh, the identity is what the society imposes upon you, or what the society makes up, makes up of you. Because, for instance, name itself. A name itself is not does not have a value in itself. It's something that um, uh, what the society or the uh, uh, common culture can construct. Of what so you're saying it's not just who you are, but how society accepts you. It, in, a, in, in a commercial sense, in an economic sense, identity is used for so many things. I do believe, and maybe it is philosophical, I do believe that we are each unique souls. Um, and, and so that's a belief system maybe. But in, a, in an economic sense, uh, we have various attributes. So those attributes might be shared. I, 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 I know, in fact, uh, yeah. Woo. So what is identity? <laughs> There's a dude up there that I share DNA with. Exact, replicable genetic material. But I, for one, think that I'm unique from him and I have a different identity. And you can be guessing while you pull this down off the canvas who's who. It's not a test. Yeah. What's that, James? Right, right, right. I don't know which side you're pointing to. Technically, the left side of the photograph. You're on the right. Well, as we see it, but on the left side of the photograph. I see. On the right. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. You're correct. But see, we're unique, different identities. Um, same DNA. Who has an iPhone with face recognition? So on Thanksgiving, Rob hands me his iPhone. He says, what do you see? And I look, he says, just look at it. And I look at it, and I say, I see a bunch of text messages. Why? And he cursed. And he said, <laughs> he said I handed you my locked phone. So uh, uh, whatever you think about biometrics and iPhones, it didn't work. Or it does work. I don't know. So I handed him back my iPhone, which is a little older, and I said, could you open it for me with your thumbprint? And he couldn't. So just for now, uh, we have a number of sets of identical twins in there, uh, my father's family and so forth. So he tried it with uh, two uh, uh, of our um, identical twin cousins, two women. And they, too, can open each other's phones. No, with their face recognition. Not with fingerprints, but with face recognition. So it just is a little side story about uh, identity. Yeah, Eric? Yeah, it's just a comment that uh, there's a function in Facebook that shows you a list of photographs that you potentially can be identified and tag you. So I keep getting pictures of my twin brother, too. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> a yeah. very poor face recognition today. You're identical. Yeah, I have yeah. it. Okay. So, I mean, if you're fraternal, then I have another thing about Facebook. No. But the, um, so there's actually a much simpler way to define identity. So philosophy aside, you know, there's these physical human beings, and there's billions of them on the planet. And one simple way to think about it is, you want to hash each person. <laughs> it's, it's very. Right, we're back. We're back to the hash functions. This is good. But that's actually what you want to do. You want to hash each person and get a number. And the property of that is that if you come to me and I hash you, I get some number. And if you come again, I get the same number. So I know I'm dealing with the same person. Even and that's if actually, I put on weight? Even if you put on weight, I, okay. I can hash because I can use your iris, let's say. Right? And your twin brother presumably won't have the same iris. I'm actually not sure, but I don't think you will. Uh, okay. 
right? So, so now I hash where I get the same number, I know who I'm dealing with, and this solves a lot of the problems in, in the business world, like KYC, uh, getting a credit card at a bank, stuff like that. And, and it also solves the problem, of, are you a new customer? Well, are you, is your hash one of the new hashes that I, is your hash a hash that I've seen in the past? Right? So, so that's a very simple way to think of identity, and, and you put philosophy aside and you assume that there's some physicality of human beings uh, that you can distinguish between using a hash function of some sort. So the question is like, how do you implement this hash function? Uh, and, and yeah. So you're, you're taking the, you're not really putting philosophy to the side, you're saying uh, that may be all well and good, but you can also take a physical object, a human, apply a hash function, a cryptographic means, and get a unique identifier for that individual. Yeah. I have a counter question to that. So like, let's say you hash everything. I can like have a counterfeit of like five things that can essentially be the same thing, and you'll just have five different hashes for it, right? Like, it'll still have to come from a non-blockchain source for you to be able to well, it's not things, it's human beings. So you, okay, but like for you to be able to hash one person, you can still reproduce five other fake people and have five different fake identities with a different hash. So that, that's, the, that's the difficulty, right? You can't actually, if, if I hash myself and I get a hash, you will have a lot of difficulty producing another human being. Mm -hmm. That when It's like finding a collision in the hash function. You have, you have very, a lot of difficulty producing a human being that has the same hash as mine because the hash function is collision resistant and it's hard to come up to clone me 100%. For example, my retina, even if I give you all the data behind my retina and, and you, you, you have it, it's very hard to produce a retina in your own eye that you can scan and pretend to be me, for example. That's one way to think of hashing somebody, is just scan their retina. And even though you know the full retina, well, it's of no use to you because you have to put it in your eye and go there and get scanned. And it's like, okay, fine. Well, our medical technology is not there yet. I'm sorry, and then we're going to move on. Uh, I was just going to say, like, if you want to take it, like, it's not even your physical representation, right? Because you can change, like, what you are physically nowadays. And so it's, like, it's what you know, what you are, and what you have are the three things that you can put into this hash function. Well, you should, it, it should be, it should be, you're right, it's not the whole of you. Like, you have to do it very carefully. So yeah. the question is, how do you cryptographically hash a person? Because, like, if you go by weight, let's say you just... Hash, yeah. The hash function is your weight. Well, that's bad because you get collisions. Yeah. So you have to do it very carefully, for sure. So, Eric, did you have some to brief. Wait. But actually, your point, the main point of your elaboration is the biometrics that's behind the whole. Uh, because it's not the hashing that's making this possible. It's the biometrics because you have, you have to actually hash something, right? When you say, when you come from the abstract, construct of saying hash somebody, you're actually saying you're hashing some biometric attribute that has to be unique to get the hash, right? It's, it's so an abstraction. Yeah. Hashing a person is an abstraction for, let's say, take a biometric. Got it's it, actually yeah. collision then, resistant. Yeah, the, the, point, the yeah. point, the really important point it comes to biometrics. That's right, that's right. And then the question is like, well, biometrics get stolen. How do you deal with that? And you have to be very careful. Yeah. With it. And it turns out that you can actually if you are careful. And it's still not a problem. Yeah, so to, to Eric's point, right, I think that that's still an, an identifier. That's not really your identity, right? Because mm -hmm. like you guys are saying, like you can you can replicate somebody's retina, let's say a thousand years down or ten years down the line, I don't know. Perhaps. Perhaps. That's right, that's right. Um, or like replicate somebody's fingertips, but that's right. that doesn't mean that you're replicating their entire identity. Well, so I like I like about. the idea of like hashing somebody's identity, hashing a person, but I, I don't think it's just hashing their eye or just hashing their... That's right, but I think you're getting philosophical. I'm looking for yeah. a perspective of, of a bank, a verifier. Yeah. What does a bank actually need to do? It just needs to map everybody to some number, yeah. and when you come back, it needs to figure out which number you are or if you're a new number. That's like all you need, and then, you know, problem solved. And then, by the way, personal data attributes, you just link those to those numbers. That's not a difficult problem. It's an orthogonal problem. It's very, you solve that independently. So, so, so let's agree that... What Alina is saying is he's not talking about our soul or our unique identity. He's talking about something that a verifier or a bank might be able to do and that you could say there's 7 billion people on, on the planet now and there'll be 10 or 12 billion one day. And, but you could take each one of them and somehow have a unique identifier, a hash function, that has each of those. 
Um, don't do it off of DNA, though, because Eric and I, you know, and hundreds of millions of others would, so that's DNA is not a unique identifier uh, for true identity. Um, so the concepts of identity, um, uh, four things that I think about, sometimes some of the papers were about three, but there's attributes, a claim, a credential, an attestation. What would be an attribute? Just any old attribute of a, any of it? What's that? Your retina, or it could be your age, address, citizenship, name, right? A claim is, my name is Gary. Or a claim might be, an, I am so old, or I am a, a US citizen. Or a, a claim might even be, I have $5,000 in my bank account. I mean, sometimes there are other forms of claims. Or I do have a bank account at Bank of America. Um, I don't think I have 5,000 in it right now. No, all right. Um, a credential is what we started with. That I think James mentioned it. A driver's license, an ID card, a utility bill sometimes. I mean, there's hundreds of forms of credentials. We think of the governmental credentials. Um, the history of credentials are interesting. The first tens of thousands of years of humankind didn't have any. And, and, and we started to have them. Passports really aren't an, even that old a, an invention. Um, in the 16th century, the King of England had some passporting, but it was so that his citizens could be recognized in other countries. It was so that their rights would be respected and somebody would not be uh, kind of messed with. Like, um, I'm under that sovereign, don't, don't you know, mess with me. But in terms of a, a true permitting system, it was largely implemented about 100 years ago, anywhere between 100 and 150 years ago. It's not that old a system, but it was old paperwork. And I don't know if any of you have ever asked to see a grandparents or great grandparents or an ancestor's like passport or those documents if, if you have them, but they're intensely paper. In fact, if they're from the late 19th century, there's no photographs. And you started to have photographs in the early 20th century. Um, um, and so it's a big change. And the last 30 or 40 years of digitization of this has actually made it a little harder in some ways. I mean, there's efficiencies, but it makes it harder. And then attestation is a third party verifying it. Um, and that's what Aline was talking about. If somebody can verify your identity, they're basically, I make a claim, my name's G Gary, I might give a credential, my passport to show it, the picture looks like me, a human looks at it, lines it up, says, all right, you can come in, you can enter the country of Germany or wherever I'm traveling. Um, they don't actually know that I'm really the, but it, it they do some verification. Um, so those are the big kind of pieces. Um, identity and access management systems. The functions, and th these are just taken from a bunch of readings, authentication, that, uh, and then authorization. Authenticating that I have the bank account authorization I can use it, or authentication I'm a US citizen, authorization I can come into the country of Germany. or you know, So based upon some attribute, somebody authorizes me. Or something that maybe some of you have dealt with at some stage of your life, that first time you went in and handed a driver's license in so you could take a drink at a bar. I'm going to make it tangible. You know, that's like authenticating. Do you look like that person? And then who are the parties in this system? Uh, users, service providers, identity providers. Um, um, anybody want to tell me about this ecosystem at all? Um, Alpha, you didn't write. You wrote last time, huh? Tom. I, again, I didn't write, but the idea of identity provider is interesting based on our conversation. 
competition, right? If we're talking about your identity being who you are, it's really identity verification provider. They're providing the documents. Um, I think, I think that's right. I mean, in, in a sense, sense. Um, uh, though identity, in a, in a more philosophic way, is who you are. But yes, the identity provider can be somebody like the state of the state of New York or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, birth certificates, death certificates, marriage certificates. Um, attribute authorities like certificate authorities are uh, kind of a, a more recent uh, invention. I don't know that they existed 100 or 200 years ago, but, but uh, an attribute authority says, these attributes, we're, we'll, we'll validate them. They're central authorities that say, yes, this is, this is correct. And certificate authorities are particularly an invention of, what, 40 years? Maybe the internet, 30 years. I think the thesis was an MIT thesis in 1976. 1976 thesis at MIT. If I remember correctly. Um, so Does anybody want to say what a certificate authority is? Because they're in the middle of all of that. By the way, every time that you go to the internet today, a certificate authority is involved in that transaction. Probably 100 billion times a day around the globe, yeah, that's probably the order of magnitude, probably 100 billion times a day a certificate authority is used. Um, Aline, you want to? Sure. Yeah. Certificate authorities right. are how we access the internet all day long. Do you want to, uh, an explanation for what they are on the web? Yeah. yeah. Right, so on the web, you have a bunch of websites. Let's say you have Facebook.com, and you want to visit it and give it your password. So if you have evil people like me, I might set up a fake server and <laughs> pretend to be Facebook.com, mess with the DNS records, get you to visit my server. So when you type www.facebook.com, you visit my server, but you can't tell. DNS is domain password. name server. Uh, the the name, domain the, name server. Yeah, the name, name server. So anyway, the idea is that when you actually do a lookup from Facebook.com to an IP address, that's actually very insecure, and attackers can mess with that and redirect you to their servers. So, and they might completely replicate the Facebook page, so you might think you're interacting with Facebook, but you're not. You're interacting with an attacker website, and you type in your password and your username, and then the attacker steals it. And then he just redirects you to the real Facebook, and you won't notice the attack at all. Does that make sense, like that yeah, problem? Yeah. And it all happens in nanoseconds. Right, so, so and it's, it's called a man in the middle attack. So, so what, what you do is you use public key cryptography to solve that problem. You say, okay, let's give each website a key pair. So Facebook.com will have a key pair, a secret key and a public key. So now the question is, well, there's a public key for Facebook.com, but how do you know you have the right public key for Facebook.com? Because an attacker could also give you a, 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 their public key for their fake Facebook.com. So now how do you distinguish between those two? That's where the certificate authority comes in. So the certificate authority signs these public keys. Uh, and, and you have the public key of the certificate authority, you have a signature from the certificate authority on the public key of facebook.com, you're now ready to trust that you're dealing with the real facebook.com and you can encrypt your password to facebook.com using your public key. There's a lot of public keys around, I know. I'm not sure if that made any sense, but. So we earlier learned about public key and private keys as part of blockchain technology. But know that when Satoshi Nakamoto wrote that paper, she was just using asymmetric cryptography, public-private key cryptography that had been invented really in the 1970s and then been adopted as the internet came along and, and took off and had a lot of use in the 1990s to secure the internet by 1996 in, in the way that the internet secured on TSL and SSL and these various ways it secured was public key, private key cryptography, a full 12 years before Nakamoto wrote the paper, um, but used for a different case. But Facebook has a public key, and all those public keys of all the websites that you visit every day there is a central authority called a certificate authority. There's actually a hundred plus certificate authorities, but, but certificate authorities that say, this is the Facebook public key. 
so that when you go to your Facebook or you go to Google or you go to shop on Amazon, you know you're actually, so that's a corporate or, or uh, that's another form of identity. It's not one with soul, I would suggest. Um, not, that's not a negative thing about Facebook. Uh, I just don't think websites, but you all might have a different philosophy. I didn't think websites have soul. Brodish. I mean, it's not clear to me how, as a user, I know that I'm going to the right website. I mean, I understand the certification happens on Facebook, but how do I know that I have tried the right website? Well, there's a, uh, I'll try to do it in lay terms, and then you'll hit it. There's kind of a handoff that when you send that signal, when you're, you're trying to access, uh, is it Facebook? You're accessing Facebook, that um, they, they send you some information, including their public key, that you are... In essence, a certificate authority is automatically checking, but uh, Aline will give you the more de technical. Let's use a simpler example. Let's say you want to go to New York Times and you want to read a headline that says something about some important thing, like tomorrow there's going to be a snowstorm. And obviously, you want to know if you're dealing with the authentic website. That seems to me like the problem. Yep. Yep. Uh, so how do you deal with that? Well, remember, the New York Times will have a public key, and they'll have a corresponding secret key. So, you, you visit their website. It turns out that when you download the website from the New York Times with that announcement about the snowstorm, that's actually signed with their secret key. So you verify the website that, that, you, that you get. You verify it against their public key. And you know that only they know the secret key. So only they could have authored that information and signed it. So you know you're dealing with the right website. It's literally the New York Times sends you a signature over every piece of information they send you, and you verify it against the public key, which in turn you verified it from a certificate authority. If you remember the little bit of broccoli we did earlier this year, that uh, asymmetric cryptography with a public key and a private key also has digital signatures. So you have now two things. Uh, let's go back to Bitcoin. In Bitcoin transactions, you have a public key and then somebody signs a transaction. And the, the math behind it, the cryptography behind it is a signature and a public key that come from the same private key, there's a way to do a function to check that they came from the same private key. And the, and the, and the heart and soul of what was invented in the 1970s was not just that there's a public key and a private key, but also that you can digitally sign it, and then when the digital signature is compared to the public key, it's unique if they came from the same private key. So going back to the New York Times, the New York Times, you have both their public key and then each headline, each piece of information has a digital signature. And, and of course, the, the, you do have a centralization, a lot of centralization on the internet related to these certificate authorities. Eric. Eric. Just a quick point, maybe to clarify. This is performed at a protocol level. That is not the user uh, witnessing any of this interaction. It's done at the, at the at the top of the TCP/IP stack, this TLS, which is the security protocol on top that uh, works with uh, HTTP, which is web. And this is done, this is where you find that this little lock in the browser that's uh, guaranteeing that that's the, the, the website you're visiting because the whole in exchange of, of uh, information that includes the public key from the website and the verification is done by the browser. Okay. So you don't do anything interactive. Yeah, we, we don't, don't do anything. anything. That little lock has that meaning. And you could actually see what certificate authority. I only pause on that to, to pause not only to tie back earlier conversations about public key and private key, but the whole internet is reliant on these certificate authorities. And blockchain technology might be a way to step around and have a new uh, um, paradigm. Kelly. Kelly. So for a contextual example, like say I'm trying to access like my brokerage account or whatever, and say I forgot my password or you know every month they want you to replace this or that to protect your account, what's how, do, how does a person interact with these various parties going through that process when it's trying to verify that it's you gaining access? What are the points of contact with those? Um, there's an initial layer, which we were just talking about, that you're actually dealing with your 
uh, I don't know, uh, I'm gonna make it up, D.E. Shaw, or no, it's, that's a hedge fund, but uh, um, with uh, Bank of America, fine, that you're really dealing, so that's what we were talking about, that you, you, they are Bank of America and you're really dealing with Bank of America and you don't even participate in that. But then there's another layer <laughs> that if you've forgotten your password, um, uh, they're gonna ask you a bunch of, of questions like you know the usual questions about who was your first pet and who was your first exactly. significant other and things like that. But at some point in time, they'll freeze you out. So uh, that's the service provider okay. that you registered with. That's Bank of America, presumably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's that's Bank of America has their anti-fraud provisions. What we were just talking about is really at the inter internet browser. And in essence, Facebook is the one that's trying to be identified, that you know you're 100 billion times a day, some human around the globe is trying to be protected that they know they're dealing with the right identity on the other side. We were talking about human identity. There's also the identity of the websites. And that's what we were just chatting about. Let me move on, and then I, if, I, if I've left you confused because you were asking about what happens if you forgot your password. Right, like how do they verify you, not you verifying them? How, how do they verify you? Um, I would contend it's still kind of a little archaic. I mean, it, it's, it's a little bit like if you, if you forgot your pa a couple of times you use a username and password, and of course if you have dual authentication, they might send you a, a notice to another you know, a text message or something. Uh, but if you've forgotten your password, then it, it's literally backdoor sort of saying, well, do you remember your question? I never remember the questions, you know? I mean, who was your first friend in elementary school? Who was your first, what was the first car you drove? But it's, it's crude. It's those, those, and then they usually freeze you out for fraud protection after two or three times of, of trying that. And almost always there's something where they can send it to you another place. So, um, Identity management, some of the pain points. Um, what, what are we trying to solve and why would blockchain technology maybe help us, help us out? Um, privacy and security is a big one. Um, there are a lot of, a lot of thefts, identity theft. Uh, how many people in, in the room have had their credit card this year in 2018, we're 11 months in, have had their credit card have to be replaced because the bank got in touch and said it's compromised? No, oh, only about 20% of us. I would have thought it was going to be more. I feel like my, I get one of those calls every 18 to 24 months. I don't know, maybe I shop too much or my daughters are using my card too much. I was going to say your bank balance is big enough to, uh, to be a target. Student banks tend to be negative. So. <laughs> you think that's it? Um, I just assume that some uh, a merchant has, has been hacked again. I mean, every time a merchant loses a million or 100,000 or 50 million accounts, then the banking system needs to send out those notices. I chair a, a commission, or a, a Financial Consumer Protection Commission in Maryland, and the credit union advocates in Maryland came to our commission and said, we need some help. Uh, we banks and credit unions have to protect a lot of data, but every time a merchant loses data, it's us credit unions and banks that have to replace all the credit cards. And they feel there's an asymmetry, commercial asymmetry, that the banking sector is bearing the brunt of other merchants, non-financial sectors, data breaches. And should the state of Maryland, this is a live issue actually in front of our commission, should the state of Maryland change its laws to put higher cybersecurity responsibilities on non-financial sector actors? And the financial sector would say, yeah, that kind of feels you'd be leveling the playing field. And the merchants are saying, you can't do that on every grocery store and bar. That, that seems like it's um, um, a little out of sync. It was. Yeah, I was going to say that credit card theft like this is a perfect application of, of uh, public cryptography. Perfect problem for public cryptography. 
Don't give out your credit card number to these folks. Your credit card should have a key pair. You should have a secret key and a public key. You give your public key to Amazon, and then you, how do you pay Amazon? Well, you sign with your secret key that's on your credit card. So nobody knows your secret key. It's on your damn card. You never lose that card. And problem solved. They can steal as many public keys as they want. Problem solved. Same thing with the SSM. Like, why would you share your yeah, SSM? Yeah, I, I disclosed to you, you became a maximalist almost. Uh, no, 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 I'm talking about public key crypto here. Yeah, Not right, about right, consensus. Right. Almost, Although almost. consensus can be a very important part of all of this. Right, right. Uh, so, so, so let me just hit, so the, the, in terms of the big pain points, privacy and security, a bunch of identity theft, forged credentials, back to the passport or the driver's license or the credit card, a forged credential, whatever that is. Um, and of course, just how do we update our personal identity for any time we move? And this term PII is, is, is three letters you'll learn in business because at some point in time, you'll be running a business and somebody will be coming in, your chief of information officer, and say, we've had a breach. And unfortunately, we broke some laws, too, because in, in the US and in other countries, GDPR, you have to protect certain data. And it's usually called PII, is usually the bucket of data you need to protect. But every time you update your personal information, your, how, do you, how do you keep uh, it updated? Uh, Ross, was there a question? I just had a question back on your Maryland example. Um, I make the assumption, maybe it's wrong, that if your commission allows the banks to, or passes that regulation. Well, we, we, we're, we're just an advisory, but right? we recommend to the General Assembly. Right? Yeah. That the banks are not going to lower their fee to the merchants. So how? what's the dollar number that they're trying to push? In other words, I'm trying to size the pain. What's, what's the amount of cost to those banks that they're trying to move to the merchants and thus drop to the bank's bottom line? I don't, I don't have a figure. It's a very good question. Uh, what, 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 what we know is that the overall statistics on fraud and credit card is, I think, high uh, teens basis points. I, I can't remember, 15 or 18 basis points, but less than 20. And it might, it's more than 10. So Visa Network charges, what, 270 basis points or so? And, and, the, fraud, and the fraud part of it's 15 or 18 basis points. And the issuing bank, it's how much of the 275? 200 or so. Yeah, so they want to move whatever that is. So but, but, but I don't know. I don't know. And this is particularly credit, credit unions are coming to us and saying, they're saying there's an externality, the merchants the gas stations. Yeah. All right, so you're, you're saying, I know which way you'd vote on our commission. <laughs> right. Um, so what, what's going on uh, a little bit about data breaches? I just tried to sort of list uh, anything over 100 million customers, but then I had to put Facebook in because it was 50 million. But these are just like a dozen or so really big data breaches. There are so many data breaches in 2018 alone that you couldn't list them on a page like this. This is the last five years of 100 million people or more data breaches. So there's, there's, there's a problem here in cybersecurity. And this is just the US. Um, British, didn't the Indian system? Like more than a billion. 1.1 1 .1 billion, yeah, billion 1 .1 people's billion. IDs were hacked, yeah, right? right? In India. Yeah. That was announced in January of this year. Um, and so you know, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot going on. And every once in a while, politically, it captures the attention of uh, particularly Equifax did, Facebook does. Wells Fargo, I think the breach was three million. It, it's not even on this. It wouldn't, it, it wouldn't get to the 50th page um, uh, by size, but it Wells Fargo had other issues that was capturing, capturing the public attention. I mean, just taking the Marriott one as an example, that's been the most recent one in the news, I think. I mean, it's so costly to these corporations. I think Marriott even said that they would pay the fee to replace passports for those affected. Like, that's, I mean, maybe it's a drop in the bucket for them, but, you know, in terms of the, the value that 
you know, the valuing the pain points, sort of like you were talking about, it's a lot. Right. It is a lot, but it's one of the, I think, one of the challenges of blockchain technology solutions is adoption. How do you get Marriott to contribute to a new system if you come up with a really clever, creative new system? Because there's so many thousands of merchants that are trying to deal with their cybersecurity risk, and Marriott all of a sudden has all these costs but how, how you get them involved in your new blockchain technology solution, I think is just an adoption issue, which somebody might solve, I just, it's not. Or as Ross says, well, wait a minute, if the banks were to just, ex right, they want to. They want to cut the fee and let everybody else, that's fine. No, I see. But, the credit, but the merchants have no bargaining power. That's true. So they cut the fee, so. Um, so. So a couple of state identity projects. Estonia has e-identity. They started in 2002, well before blockchain technology. And it's run on a software called X-Road software. Um, and while some folks might think of Estonia as a blockchain-friendly nation, um, does anybody want to take a guess whether this software is blockchain technology? What's, what's the consensus? No, it's not. Um, that doesn't mean it doesn't work, uh, but um, uh, they've sort of wrapped themselves in the sort of spirit of we're a blockchain nation. And they, they also have e-health records and many other records that are going online. Um, and it may be at some level inspired by uh, that. They have 1.3 million people in Estonia. I think a bigger the state actor and the challenge, <laughs> sorry, British, is Adhar. Uh, so there's a national identification system, and it was promoted really for inclusion, financial inclusion, and a way to, to get um, government assistance and, and, and welfare to hundreds of millions of poor. Um, India, at the time that it was rolled out, well over half of India was not, had, did not have a banking account at all. Um, 12-digit ID and biometrics being fingerprint and iris scan. I think they would deal with the identical twin issue, I, I think, um, from my uh, uh, little um, example that my twin brother's Rob's finger didn't open my iPhone. Um, but there's been a lot of problems. And neither that's not a blockchain project either. But it has... I. My read of it is Adhair, and maybe Brodish has some views, has done some very positive things in India. But it's also come with some very scary things. Brodish. It's a quick nugget of information. So What's that say? It's a quick nugget of information about Adhair. It was the fastest system in the world to reach 1 billion users, faster than Facebook or any other uh, online platform. And it, it, it was an optional, I mean, it, it was not a mandatory system for people to get in. It was an optional system, but it was the fastest one to reach one billion. But it, it, it's optional, but you can't get your government assistance any longer if you're not in it, right? It, it's, it's not like that. So actually, there has been some government efforts to make it that way. But then the court actually rejected those proposals. So they said that you cannot make it mandatory to you know, make people receive benefits based on this. So whoever has that, they might have some ease of obtaining those benefits, but it's not like without it, you cannot be right. so Brodish, Brodish is saying it accurately, but the court only ruled that this year during 2018, I think. And for a while, a lot of hundreds of millions of people thought, that's the only way I can get my assistance. But the 12-digit ID and the biometrics has produced a system where, along with a payment system, where you can do a QR code right on your iPhone and, and get goods and services. And it's pretty efficient, but it's one national system. One national system, and uh, there's been a lot of challenges, not just the hack, but also uh, some mistakes sometimes. And based on those mistakes, people feel like they've lost their identity. I mean, they're still this human that they are, but they've lost it in a governmental sense, and thus they've stopped getting their assistance. And there's occasionally reports of suicides and reports of deaths and things like that where people are no longer recognized in the system because they're Adhar ID. 
So there's a, a lot of public debate in India and, and, and uh, about uh, the net benefit versus some of the costs. Um, Self-sovereign identity. Uh, four things I think about. Uh, people and identities control, and entities. People and entities control their identities more than we have now. This is a concept. These, um, we have direct access without some intermediary. Uh, um, our identity is transportable, but not our human identity, but the attributes of, of our identity. So I use the term more loosely here. And then um, it's widely usable or interoperable. Self-sovereign identity, what's that? Yeah, I was just thinking interoperable. <laughs> yeah, I kind of remembered that back and forth. Um, uh, Self-sovereign identity does not rely on blockchain technology. It's a concept and a debate about should, should we go back to something that we, in a sense, had in the 19th century and even early 20th century, that, that we, we could walk into any store and there might, there might be other forms of censorship. There are certainly many prejudices and, and racism and all sorts of challenges, but we could walk in without a document. You know, we, we, we weren't walking in. It wasn't, we might have some gold, some money in our pocket. They would take the gold coin or the silver coin. Self-sovereign identity is also thinking about um, can we sort of have the individual hold their credentials as we held a physical passport but hold it in a, in a wallet in some way. Ross. Just your example of the 19th century ties into the question that I had, is, which is, doesn't this only work if you also have a decentralized money system? Like, go to your example. The only reason that works is because people could go in and pay with a completely anonymous form of money. If, if unless you have a real broad, say, Bitcoin distributed system, your bank will require you to waive this. When you sign up for a bank account, you will have to waive this. I, 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 and it's gone. They just will. So, so Ross is raising, well, well, will this even work unless you have a truly decentralized uh, money system? Uh, I don't think it's reliant on a decentralized money system. I can see your point that it's benefited by a decentralized any, money system. Any commercial transaction you have, the counterparty is, you know, Facebook will make you wait, right? Because they want the information, right? And Google will. That's right, you can cut yourself off from all those things. But they'll just make it a part of the contract, part of the access that you wait. So, so self-sovereign identity, concept that all of us humans could control our identity, not just our birth and our nationality, but maybe even our digital uh, footprint, um, our, our spending patterns, and so forth. And Ross is raising, well, maybe Facebook and Google wouldn't transact with us. As a commercial reality, you're saying their market power, they might cut us out. Um, I think some might try, and that will be, I mean, this hasn't been really adopted self sovereign identity. I have a question for your Consumer Protection Commission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maryland probably won't be able to weigh into that too much. Uh, uh, the benefits of, of taking identity access management systems onto the blockchain technology. And, uh, and, uh, Eight or ten of you wrote papers on this. So does anybody want to uh, comment on on this? Is like my summary. Some of the benefits. You can address verification costs and fraud. You potentially can lower some of the costs and fraud. I think you can trace provenance. Uh, you deal with censorship uh, and so forth. And 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 truly, I think you can help um, on privacy. But the challenge is is uh, um, uh, the, the real challenge is, is that uh, if you're storing personal identifiable information on a blockchain, blockchain technology works by distributing the data to all the nodes. And so the, the initial write-ups three and four and five years ago was like, well, could you put uh, self-sovereign identity, in essence, in a blockchain and store it, and everybody started to say, no, you really can't do that because you're not going to put my, all, all my personal stuff 
on 10,000 nodes. Um, so, I mean, the first benefit there, I think, should be prevent identity theft. Because the main security goal of any identity scheme, including the one I described, is you want to prevent identity theft. You want to pre prevent impersonation. I'm sorry, I, be able back. To... I, I just chose not to re redo this page. Right. I, I'm agreeing with you. I just. I mean, these are the pain points it would all address. Yeah. And in general, I think when you think about identity, that should be, you should have, you have to look at it through that lens. Because what else is identity for if it's not for preventing people to claim they're someone else? That's what an identity scheme does. And if your scheme doesn't address that fundamental problem, like, by the way, all of these startups don't, uh, because SSM numbers are still out there and required legally. So as long as that's a social scheme, security numbers. Yeah, say goodbye to, to preventing identity theft. What are you doing then? You know? yeah. I think I'll go here and Hugo. Yeah. And like something that was not like very much addressed in the readings, I thought, was like also that fact that if you used a blockchain technology, so apparently log, like it's immutable, so it's often seen as a good thing. But here in this case, like normally, like example in Europe, normally in the internet you can request to uh, delete information you have if like Google has a link uh, which mentions you, for instance. But like here, you wouldn't be able to do it because the information is there. Like if someone like steals it, or like even if you want to delete it, somehow you can't because it's immutable, right? So how can we deal with this? So you're raising a point that in Europe, on the new privacy law, uh, the GDPR, you have a right to be forgotten or a right to be deleted. And so how can blockchain technology interact and work within that framework. Um, if your actual information is on the blockchain, I think you're right. I think it's very hard. But I do think there are solutions if it's just a hash of your information that's being stored on the blockchain. I think this it, is what they were mentioning in the reading as well, like the fact that like you can store all the data basically of the blockchain. And then when you transfer, you just say like as a certification, oh yeah, this is my information, and it is true, you can verify it is true. But you cannot have like the actual, the actual information, information on a distributed yeah. network. Um, uh, Kelly. I think that's a really interesting point. And one of the sort of use cases I think of goes back to the original attributes that you're talking about. So for example, what about citizenship? Right? I mean if in your digital identity it says you're a United States citizen and that changes, can that be changed, you know, if it's immutable, A. And then B, what about those privacy um, issues, right? Like, for people that do not have, you know, maybe it's not like a fully verifiable citizenship, then we have a whole host of problems there as well. So I think uh, you raise a good question, but it's any, uh, this is one of the challenges of any uh, identity database, but it's also a challenge of, of a money database called Bitcoin. You have ownership today, and tomorrow you might no longer have the coin. Uh, uh, today, uh, you might live in um, Massachusetts, but a year from now, when you get your fancy job and wherever you are, you might not live in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. You. Um, so I don't think it's just citizenship. It's just the updating the records and the attributes uh, that you're no longer uh, can vote here, can no longer. Uh, yeah, it just goes back to the trade-offs that we were originally talking about. Like, there's a lot of, you know, it certainly helps a lot of things like defending identity theft, but there's also a lot of other there are challenges, but I think, I think that challenge is, is uh, surmountable. So, but like, even though it's immutable, you can, append, like, you can append new information. So isn't that the whole like, purpose of like, blockchain? Like, yeah, your citizenship may change, but then you append new information saying that your citizenship has been updated. And that becomes the source of truth now. Like, uh, I'm agreeing with that. I think that's correct. I think that's a solvable. Uh, 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 challenge. Um, Je well, you, Hugo had his hand up, and then we're going to go on just to. Yeah. So I want to question the idea that like having a blockchain means identity theft is no longer an issue. <laughs> I think it makes it like a bigger issue. 
Because what happens if you lose your private key or if somebody finds your private key or like somebody cuts your eye out or whatever, you know, like, like, yeah. and they, That's like, no, but, but, but really, right? What happens if somebody steals your identity, then it's gone. Like, you're not getting it back, right? There's well, no steals idea. your private key. Steals your your private identity is sure. still. Sure. Yeah. Steals your private key. Like, if you don't protect that with your life, then, like, your life is gone, right? Like, like, right, but I, I think you guys are raising the right question, but that just means that's not the right solution. You can't pin it all on just one private key that's lost. Well, the answer is also use multiple biometrics. Uh, and yeah, sure, if you lose your hand, your eye, your retina, and you go to the DMV, well, maybe they'll make an exception for you. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, like 10 people ever show up in that way. But let, me, let me try to just plow in for a second of what are the projects. And th this, is, this is a short representation. There's, I could have made three more pages of representation. Um, uh, I'm going to hit three or four of these just for fun. There's three or four that are ICOs. I'm going to choose to skip all of those. But there are, I want to mention that Civic Secure Identity, Existence ID, Sovereign, which gets S-O-V-R-I-N, but Sovereign that gets a lot of write-ups in other papers. Uh, we're all ICOs, initial coin offerings, to use a token to in incentivize a system of self, usually self-sovereign identity in some point. None are up and running yet. And, and, and as you know, I've had my doubts about some initial coin offerings. But there are three or four, and there were probably six or 10 others that I didn't quickly find. Um, uh, BitNation is an interesting project that literally, you can voluntarily get a citizenship in BitNation. It is a decentralized, borderless, voluntary nation. But the key word is voluntary. They don't have a UN membership. They're not part of the World Trade Organization. They have no geography. Uh, but the concept is you can get a BitNation passport, and you can get some authentication through that about some <laughs> attributes about your birth and things like that. Um, there is a, a standard setting group, a D distributed identity foundation that we're going to talk about in a minute, and I'm going to show a slide which is just a whole bunch of efforts coming together and saying, well, maybe we can do some standards uh, uh, around this. Um, and then there's rebooting Web of Trust that r runs events. I think their only economic model is to, to make money on the events. But some of their research and some of their papers are very interesting um, uh, that you, you can read about this. And, and not listed on this, one area that's spending a lot of time on self-sovereign identity uh, is the World Wide Web, uh, I think it's consortium, but w W3C, where you can go and on GitHub, you can read all sorts of information from WC W3C about self-sovereign identity, and they're promoting ways to do digital ID, and, and trying to form standards. So I think W3C, which is not really a blockchain project, and this Distributed Identity Foundation, for any of you that are actually interested in pursuing some of this, you want to stay abreast of it because it's the standard setting also that I think will be relevant. Um, but questions or thoughts for those who have done research on some of these, other than Aline, who we've heard from a bunch? All right, what's your question? Well, my first thought is they don't solve identity theft in the United States. They, they don't, don't solve identity theft, theft in right. the United States. Why? Because there's a certain policy by the US government that asks everyone to accept SSNs. And if James has my SSN, then James is me for all intents and purposes. So that is a policy issue. So these companies are basically a very inefficient way to change the policy. Like hundreds of millions of dollars being invested in all of these guys. And by the way, all of them do public key crypto. It's not like something uh, revolutionary here. But at some point, some of them will get some market share, maybe convince a few banks. But maybe those banks will convince the government to start doing the right So you're, you're saying that the ch the an, an underlying challenge, at least in this country, is that we have an antiquated public policy related to a tax ID called social security num number. And uh, initially, social security numbers were not even a tax ID. Initially, they were to participate in a retirement 
program called Social Security. And you were not legally required to have a number in the 1930s or 40s when it first came about. Um, I didn't get my Social Security number until I was 14, I think. Um, now you, you, you pretty much get them at birth in this country. Um, you can't use it for much. You're not working. <laughs> but um, but you're, you're saying it's a public policy a challenge, at least here. I would say in every country there's some public policy challenges that are very real around how attributes of of identity are measured, whether it's off of taxes or birth records and so forth. Can I hold, because I want to just hit uh, two other things. Uh, this foundation, these are all the people in this foundation doing all of this work. Like It's just a list that you can look at later. And they've set up, and I apologize, they set up sort of this whole idea about decentralized ID and service. So they have a whole program. It's not a small effort that they are investing in this. And I only put it up to say, there's a lot of energy. Aline might be right, it's all you know, fraught with some risk because it's on the backs of government ID systems, not just in the US. Um, um, public key infrastructure is currently, uh, could change. And, and a lot of these concepts are on decentralized public key infrastructure. Basically, where are these public keys? Whether it's Facebook's public key or any public key, where is it stored? I suspect, Aline, that you'd say this is at least going a little, little better direction, right? Um, this is a key part of just saying, instead of the public key and having these certificate authorities, to have a secure way to store the public keys in a decentralized, hashed, using hash functions and blockchain technology. And I think all of them have this in the middle of it somewhere. It's a consensus problem, right? You want to agree. Everybody needs to agree what Facebook's public key is. Otherwise, we're in trouble, because you might use my fake Facebook server. So it's really just a consensus problem. It's not about hashes, security. Forget about that. Everybody has to agree what Facebook's public key is. And that's where the blockchain comes in. All right. Oh, sorry, Sean. I uh, just wanted to answer uh, Alan's, uh, Alan's question. Basically, uh, that's not, I don't think that's a, a public policy problem. It's the way if you want to change the SSN system, you have to change the whole entire system of like how the banks operate, how the insurance company operate, and the cost, the social cost is much greater than just changing the kind of the key, key itself. I mean, I, I think he's entirely talking about the point of view of the, uh, about the implement, implementation of the system, but he's not taking into consideration of the hidden economic cost of such implementation. But there's the Patriot Act, which says banks have to send your SSN to the government, which basically means banks need to yeah. continue using SSNs. So in some sense, you're right, but, but also government has to do something. Yeah. So let's move on. I don't think it's just here in the US. What's happened is, is the attributes of our identity or our credentials of identity, whether it's for tax systems, for banking systems, in the last 30 odd years as we've digitized and also post 9-11 and terrorists, we started, to, we started to use all of these things for anti-money laundering, know your customer. So the financial system, the tax system, and our identity systems have now all been you know, kind of linked up and, and not always with the best intent. I mean, maybe they were good intentions, but not with the best results. Um, and it's part of why I thought if we were going to cover blockchain technology in the financial sector, identification systems were really important as well because it's so linked up with banking and finance. Um, and that wouldn't have been the case uh, before the digital revolution and the internet and so forth. Um, I think this is the last cover slide, but this is self-sovereign identity platforms. Basically, right now, uh, if, if we want to keep our identity, if we want to keep our identity and only give it up, uh, a platform could create and enforce rules governing the workflow. This is a little thing called bit, uh, uh, what's that, bitsonblocks.net. 
pretty much most of the startups are using an architecture around this. This happens to be bits on blocks view of it. But it's basically, I'm going to keep my attributes of identity, and I choose when I can give it up and when it's used, uh, uh, authorities uh, and issuers. So I think I have, hopefully, oh yes, MIT. That's where I wanted to go. So what did you all think? You read, you read the little article about your own. Uh, um, you're going to get in it. James, you're going to get your blockchain tech blockchain yep. diploma? Uh, I, personal experience, I started trying to get hold of my uh, diploma back in 2012 for, for a degree that I got in 2007. My university was declared independent from the University of London. There's a whole record <coughs> mess up. Um, trying to get a copy of my transcript. You I can't get it. I had to go through many different people say, oh, can I get it? And they say, oh, we have to contact the old university because we, went, we were part of them. Right. So, it's a right. Right. so how many of you are going to get a, a, a blockchain-backed uh, diploma when you graduate MIT? All right, a quarter of you. And, and those of the, that aren't, uh, who, who didn't raise their hand? What's that? You didn't? Oh, you will. Wait a minute. I didn't see any hands go over here. So you're not, I, I don't care really. What's that? Oh, you did? I, I, I want somebody who didn't raise their hand. Why aren't you going to get it? For me, it's just pure lack of information about the process, how to get it, what I have to do. So I, I don't know yet if I will or not. So you're just saying it's, it, there's an information curve. You have to learn about it. The people that raised their hand said you get it. How many of you will also get a paper diploma? <laughs> you want something for the wall, or, or for the significant other, or for the children, or the parents, right? Right? Yeah, there's still something about that. I don't even know where my college diploma is, by the way. Um, uh, but you still want that piece of paper. Was there anybody who was only going to get a blockchain diploma? No. And any of you that go to a different university, do you wish your university had a blockchain diploma? No, no, he's going to speak up. <laughs> Maybe not. All right, so it's a novelty. It's MIT. We're innovative. We have it. Um, I hope you all do come next Tuesday. It will be our last time together. I'm going to try to wrap up sort of with some ground truths as to what I think uh, the whole uh, topic and the subject is. This was meant to be about the business of blockchain technology, getting through at least enough of the details, knowing those details, and then saying, well, how does that apply uh, uh, to the markets? With hopefully, hopefully, you feel that you've gotten uh, and. Tuesday, we'll summarize it all, some critical reasoning skills that you can sort through the hype and the reality. And um, uh, uh, those of you that came in maximalist, you're probably more in the middle. Some of you that were minimalist maybe came, well, maybe you're still, but you came you know, a little, because I, I thought that was the right place to teach. Uh, and you've all given me a tremendous uh, uh, feedback, and I've learned a lot from you all, but let's keep it going. See you on Tuesday.